we started talking about this a couple of days ago, but as soon as it kind of came up, we kind of knew that what we had to talk about in the beginning of this episode, which is the changes that they're making to the scene loyalty points program. <laughs> it's, I think we're the only two per- people in Canada who like debate this as fiercely as we do. Yeah. Um, so for those of you who are listening who have no idea what we're talking about, uh, the predominant chain of movie theaters in Canada, which regrettably has been mostly closed for the past year, um, they have this loyalty program called Scene, and you earn points. And I'd say I'd say like lots of other exhibition companies like AMC and and others probably have something similar, but. Um, With the scene program here in Canada, you can earn points when you buy movie tickets, and it's kind of like a buy 10, get one free type of situation. And you can earn points on concessions, purchases as well. And then there's a few banks and things. They've they've got uh, promotional credit cards where you can earn even more points if you use the special credit card. So it's been around for a number of years. There's, I'd say there's a kind of a decent uptake of it across Canada. You know, there's a decent number of people who are participating in it. But Scene sent out an email a couple of days ago saying that they're changing the way that points get earned again. And the only way to kind of take it is that Cineplex as a company is kind of hurting financially. And so they're they're making it harder to get a free movie from my reading of it. Yeah. So they actually kind of snuck this one under the radar. I almost missed it. And, and because we don't go to the movies right now, it's kind of easy to miss. But basically, the new deal, I think, is for every dollar you spend at Cineplex, you get five points. Yeah, it's a yeah. For every dollar, you get five points. And then assuming they don't change how much a free ticket costs, that essentially means that you have to spend roughly the equivalent of like one movie ticket plus some concessions or perhaps two movie tickets. Uh, in order to get the same number of points that you would before. It's a very slight reduction in the in the way it's, you earn stuff. It, it ends up being like maybe 10 or 15% less so earning potential. It used to be 10 points per dollar, right? It used to be that you bought a movie ticket and you got 100 points. Okay. And uh, a free ticket would cost you 1,000 points. So therefore, 10 movie tickets, 100 points every time, 1,000 points total. Yes, Yeah, that was easy to figure out, yeah. But now they've changed it so it's based on the dollars that you spend, so it's gotten more confusing, and clearly, like, you know, it'll be harder if you only go on your own to buy tickets. Single tickets, they're kind of trying to encourage people to go as a group and buy concessions. So, you know, not the most evil thing in the world, but still just a little bit of of a screw you, considering that none of us have been able to even use our scene points for, like, the better part of a year. Well, that's, that's the thing. Like, it's funny they call these things, like, loyalty programs right when all they do is drive away like i think your your biggest consumers yeah if cineplex is hurting and they kind of are for sure i always thought the better way to do it is to give you more scene points like just get people through the door yeah not that that's a good idea right now in the middle of a pandemic but when we can go to the movies again i feel like maybe they should be a time where you get double the scene points where you can go see the same movie multiple times because we're getting a lot of blockbusters like still lining up right yeah and also like i just miss going to theaters and watching the same film multiple times even sure and and i miss the kind of like the sense of being able to use your scene points for a movie that you were kind of iffy on yes and you know obviously in the the grand scheme of things you are still paying for the ticket in a long sort of way, because obviously you've bought other things to earn the points that you then spend on a free ticket. Right. So it's not like you're really getting it for free, but there's a sort of, you know, it's a sort of sense that you are. And so if you, yeah, definitely. If, if there's a movie out there that you're kind of iffy on, or even one that you think is totally bad, you feel less cheated by using scene points to pay for it. Oh, of course. I, I, I redeem my uh, free movie on bad movies all the time, like a conscious decision to do it. Yeah. Because there's no way you can get me to pay for it. Right. Some of these points are so hard to accumulate i almost don't even bother sometimes yeah like air miles and aeroplan and stuff like, like that. you ever you ever get those uh pc points from shoppers oh yeah that's a real scam you, they really you can't get anything out of it i can't even get like a can of pop i think with the <laughs> points i earn and i hate the ones where like you accumulate points but you can only use them on certain items in certain periods of time. Oh, yeah, blackout periods and stuff, yeah. Yeah, like uh, supermarkets are really bad for that. I just, uh, it drives me nuts. Yeah, so at least, like, for the longest time, Scene had probably one of the more positive arrangements where 
it was very transparent how you earned the points and then you could redeem them for a consistent thing every time. And by and large, that's not changing. It's just it feels a little bit kind of scummy the way they're they're changing it while we're still sort of locked in our homes. They'd been piloting this um, like uh, elite tier. And this is like, <laughs> yeah, I remember that, like the height of nerddom when it comes to movie going in Canada. But they, they had literally been piloting a and it's sort of an elite tier of scene called scene gold. And I think they were uh, they were testing it out in a couple of markets out west. Yeah, Edmonton, uh, I think it Edmonton. Was. Yeah, you heard about it somewhere. And again, like. It really wasn't that much of a savings. In fact, it was it was like a monthly subscription that you paid and then you got certain benefits like, you know, access to a VIP concessions line. And, uh, th- you know, I, I guess there was maybe some that's key, though. It's key when you're running late. Like if you show up and you want you know, you want your concessions, but you don't want to miss trailers or anything. It's good to know that you have that there. And I mean, it wasn't the program never sounded as cool as what they've had in the UK at some of the um, the Cineworld theaters where you would pay a monthly subscription and get unlimited movies. Which is a great deal. I think some of that kind of similar membership deal is available in the States too. Yeah, but they've never done it in Canada for some reason. Scene Gold, I'd, I mean, maybe they what they whatever they learned from piloting it over a year ago, maybe they will eventually add the unlimited movies for a monthly subscription. It's obviously, it's a bit of a money loser for the theater. But yeah, our market's just too small, I think. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that. But anyway, thank you for listening to our um, <laughs> five or six minute uh, tear on uh, the scene program. So let's get into talking about some movies, shall we? Welcome to episode 91 of the Extra Buttery Podcast, a free-flowing conversation between two guys who love film and TV. My name is Robert Snow in Toronto, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jason Chen, in Vancouver. And this time on the show, we're going to be focusing on two new releases. As promised in our bonus episode that uh, came out a little bit ago, we took a bit of a pause on new releases for that episode, but now we're swinging on back. And this time we're going to be talking about Minari, directed by Lee Isaac Chung, and Judas and the Black Messiah, directed by Shaka King. So uh, should we start with Minari, I guess? That that one just came out uh, the weekend that we're recording this. Uh, so it's kind of kind of the freshest, I suppose, of the two. Sure. Um, and this has been one that I guess has sort of been circulating amongst the film Twitter folks uh, for what feels like a better part of a year. I can't remember which festival it premiered at, but I feel like we've been kind of anticipating its full release for a while. Yeah, because it won uh, the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance. Right. So it's been more than a year since it actually first saw audiences. And uh, yes, I, they had originally hoped to release it as more of like a traditional festival film or awards uh, circuit film in fall of last year when, you know, if there hadn't been a pandemic on, a lot of the Oscar bait stuff would, would have been coming out. But they decided to kick it right to the very end of February, just inside of the, the new eligibility window for the Oscars. I don't like grandma. Grandma smells like Korea. Yeah. What about grandma smell? And it also got some buzz recently at the Golden Globes because it was nominated for Best Foreign Film and not Best Film. Even though it's an American production about an immigrant family in America. So wrap wrap your head around that. Yeah, literally about the American gene. Of all like the the best picture nominees and what's not, this is probably like one of the more American stories out there too, right? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so the, the I think the outrage or the frustration that people were voicing when the Globes did that uh, was, was very much justified. And I mean, I can talk for, for a long time about this movie, but I actually, I want to hear from you first because oh, of, okay. of the two of us, uh, like... Obviously, your your own history is not identical to what we see in this movie, but there's some right. common threads, I guess. You know, I mean, you you came yeah, to Canada as a young yeah. kid and and all of that. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, first of all, the movie's um, about the Yi family, um, and the patriarch is Jacob Yi, played by Stephen Yoon, who's excellent, by the way. Mm. And he is uh, part of this young Korean family with his wife Monica and their two kids, Anne and David. And so the story is that they had 
jobs uh, sexing chicks in California, but they didn't own much. And so Jacob and his family moved to rural Arkansas and buy this plot of land that they want to turn into a farm, a farm that specifically grows vegetables that Korean people are more familiar with. And this is sort of his big American dream. And so what starts off as sort of a, I guess, a rocky relationship between him and his wife, because farming is very difficult and they fall into debt. She doesn't quite understand what his vision is, because in her mind, they just bought a plot of dirt. You know, in California, at least they could pay the bills. Now they're taking this big risk in the middle of nowhere where there's tornado warnings and work is really hard and there's no one around them for hours. And they're also they're worried about David, the youngest son, because uh, yes, he, has he has a heart a, condition, a heart condition, a heart murmur. And uh, the, the the farm that they've bought is about an hour away from the nearest hospital. And the mother, she's been told by the doctors, you know, if he runs, if he does anything that's like physically exerting, uh, he could drop dead. Right. Like his heart could stop. Right. So she's terrified about that. And she she thinks that Jacob has sort of led them off into the wilderness, basically. Yeah, right. And so obviously their experience was not the same as mine, no. <laughs> but there are, you're right, there are common threads. And most of these immigrant stories talk about culture shock and the difficulty of being an immigrant where there's a lot of self-doubt, a lot of doubt about who you are and what you're doing because Jacob is taking a really big risk. At some point in the movie, and this is like a big crux of the relationship, he has to decide between his family or the farm. Yeah. Because his wife is not fully on board and it's easy to see why they're very secluded and she doesn't they don't have a support group. And it's part of the reason why they join this local church. I can speak to the self-doubt and the culture shock a little bit more so the self-doubt, because I think when you're someone who's grown up in one culture and then transplanted into another whole different culture, there are certain things that you always question. You know, it's kind of like moving schools when you're high school. What is cool at one high school is not cool at another high school. If you're a jock at one high school, you're going to be the dumb kid in drama school. <laughs> right. And so there's a bit of that, right? <laughs> and so um, Lee Isaac Chung, this was like a semi-autobiographical film for him. He had been born in Denver and Colorado, and his family had moved to a rural part of Arkansas and started a small farm there. I think... What's most interesting to me, though, was that there is a point where they start interacting with the broader community, which is predominantly white and Southern. And I, what I really appreciated is that the racism in this film isn't really meant to be antagonistic. It exists, but because it's there's a ignorance around it. There are people in Arkansas have never been to Korea. Right. People in Arkansas have never eaten Korean food like they have. And so some of it's very honest. So... There's one scene where David's at a local church, a little local party get together. Yeah. And he's grabbing some punch. And this other white kid who has like, who's just curious. He has no ill intentions at all. And he just goes up to him and he says, why is your face so flat? Yeah. And, you know, in, in some ways it can be construed as, you know, demeaning or racist, but not in that context. And I think that's where a lot of nuance is lost, especially today where arrogance and ignorance is really hard to separate. Yeah, and, and at first when that scene played out, I, I tensed up a bit because I wasn't sure which direction it was going to go, but um, they actually went in just in a very kind of pure sort of direction where the, yeah, the yeah. kid was just, he, he just was ignorant about uh, other cultures. He just hadn't seen a, any anybody who looked different from him before. Yeah, exactly. And by the end of it, he asked David, like, can you come to a sleepover party, basically? Yeah. And so it, it was it was born out of uh, like just a mis simple misunderstanding. And I don't think um, the boy's question was entirely illegitimate either. Yeah. I think he's just making an observation that, hey, this kid's different. And there was another part where his daughter was at the same party. And then this other girl comes up and she's like, I'm going to make a bunch of sounds. And just stop me if I actually say something Korean. <laughs> yeah. And that could go in a no whole different other direction too. But this uh, this girl who who talks to Anne, she ends up saying something in Korean by accident. But she thinks it's cool that, you know, that something that is not in the English dictionary is a, is a word in another uh, language. Right. And I thought that was beautifully done because we've seen too many movies where like the racism is very antagonistic and it's 
very obvious right away. Yeah. And it all like, you know, depending on the movie, all it accomplishes is it kind of it paints the culture that's doing the racism, uh, for lack of a better term, um, with one big brush. And it says like, oh, here's here's the protagonist family. Right. And they're in uh, lost in this sea of racism or whatever. But it's not really the case. Like, you know, in this situation, it's the folks just want to learn more about each other. Right. And we have Hollywood has a tendency to also paint, you know, deep South people as dumb hillbillies. Yeah. And so they kind of avoid this, too. Um, Obviously, you know, their their life is not extravagant. Life is hard on the farm, but they don't paint these people as dumb people. They're genuinely kind people who have, you know, just have a hard time making ends meet sometimes. Yeah. And so. One of the characters that I've always been curious about is Paul, who's played by Will Patton. Yeah, I love Will Patton. He's been doing some... (laughs) Yeah. He's been playing good old boys for a long time, but he's really in his element here. Right. And I want to ask you, what did you think of Paul? Because I thought he was borderline hilarious, but also kind of weird that, you know, I wonder if there was a real life Paul in uh, uh, Lee Isaac Chung's life. There had to have been. I, I feel like the details around Paul were just too specific to 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 have been kind of made out of whole cloth, basically. Right. This, so let's paint a picture of Paul, though, right? Yeah. So Paul is like this. The, he's like a good old boy, um, like bald head, big, huge Coke bottle glasses. And he uh, he first arrives in the movie when he sells an old tractor to Jacob mm-hmm. and during that transaction, he says to Jacob, hey, I'm a good worker. You know, I've, I've worked on farms my whole life. I'd love to, to, to come and help you out with this farm because you obviously need the help. And Jacob's initially kind of like a bit standoffish because he's not sure if he can trust Paul or, or what's going on. But then eventually Jacob brings him on as his main laborer. And they don't really develop a, a friendship per se. I think they, they keep it very like boss for, and employee for a long time. And Jacob is a little bit weirded out by Paul because he's a very Bible thumping, like evangelical Christian and has Who a, carries a cross down the highway every Sunday. That's the biggest image from the whole movie with 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 regard to Paul. Like he doesn't go to church, but he drags a crucifix on his shoulder uh, down a dirt road and is a bit of like a local pariah because the, the kids who are on the, the bus coming from the church uh, make fun of him, or at least the white kids do. And because they just think it, they think he's silly, but clearly everything about Paul is very honest, very salt of the earth. So like no wife, no kids, simple life. He mentions being in Korea at one point. Could it be that he was a Korean War veteran then? Yeah, I think so. Because he's about like uh, Will Patton is like what in his early sixties. So yeah, you know the his character if it's set in the eighties, then the Korean War been was thirty in, years. Yeah, yeah, so he could have he, he was in he would have been the right age. Yeah, I think that's what. That's how he like found himself in Korea. And, and the backstory, the implied backstory is that he had some sort of PTSD, some sort of like really modest family background. Something happened to him that maybe turned, you know, made him turn a new leaf. And that's why he does that crucifix exercise every Sunday. Yeah. Very good with his hands. Uh, very salt of the earth. We use overuse that phrase, but he is totally salt of the earth yeah and he, he all he wants to do is help the the e family and uh, J- and jacob is like is still very standoffish around him and and um paul is convinced that the the double wide trailer that they're living in is needs an exorcism for some reason there's there's something something to do with the previous owner of the farm right. who right. uh shot himself because he uh he the far farm failed on him he couldn't make it a success so paul feels that he needs to perform an exorcism yeah. in there and like dribble dribble holy water all, all around the various surfaces and and that freaks jacob out even more he's like he does not know what to make of it but um it's funny how after that happens Things continue to get worse for the family for a little bit, but then there's a sudden kind of the movie says, mm, maybe maybe something that Paul did actually did have an impact. You, you can't really know. And I think that having the character of Paul is really important because if the if the Yi family was left to their own devices, they would not have been able to accomplish what they did so quickly and so easily. Yep. And this was kind of similar to my experience when we moved here. Um, obviously, we already had sort of like a network of friends who could help us out. But when we moved to Vancouver, we had uh, people, our neighbors, who were like super helpful, showed us the ropes a little bit, like made people feel really welcome. And I think that's a really big part of American culture and immigrant stories. The ones that managed to 
not so much assimilate, but at least get used to life in a new world, always had a bit of help. The ones that didn't help um, either defaulted back to their own communities, um, which is why you get a lot of like um, immigration from specific areas to specific cities. Right. They never sort of commingle. And so there's always that divide in between them. And I think that's what we're seeing a lot of it now is that people are just very divisive. You're that you're you and I'm me. And there's no like middle ground that people can reach. And you're right. Like it was important, I think, to also show that uh, Jacob was really skeptical of Paul. Yeah. And even his wife was. But at the end, his wife kind of became more accepting of Paul than Jacob himself. Yeah. Which I thought yeah. was really funny. The other sort of key character in this is the grandma. Yeah, I was going to ask you about her. Yeah, because she, she has yeah. this relationship with the the kid who's, I guess you could call him the main character of the movie, which is David. Who does a really good job, by the way. Yeah, I mean, as far as child child actors go, like this kid is, is putting in 150%. Two languages, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when they move to the farm, uh, their grandmother, Monica's mother, is not with them, mm-hmm. uh, but... Uh, she joins them a little bit later once they've settled in and she has never met David before. Mm-hmm. So David has this idea of grandmothers as kind of kindly and they bake cookies <laughs> and they give hugs. And I guess a part of that is just kind of informed by pop culture and, and, and stuff like that. Yeah. And his like environment. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But then when uh, his actual grandmother does come, he discovers that she likes to gamble. She likes to curse. She likes to watch wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, likes to watch 80s wrestling on TV. And uh, she's not interested in doing any of the typical, you know, uh, stereotypical grandmotherly things. And it throws David for a loop because I guess he uh, not only is he kind of adrift by finding himself in this farm location after growing up in the city. And he's only what, like four or five years old, maybe a little older, but around that eight, yeah, six or seven, his, his sister would be around 10 or 11. For him, there's just, there's just a lot happening to him all at once. You know, he's, he's, he's anxious about the general situation. He, he, uh, he's aware that his parents are fighting a lot over the, their finances. And here's this grandmother and he starts to kind of, uh, affix all of the problems that the family's experiencing on her. And he kind of, she's the problem that's, you know, if he can get rid of her, maybe everything will be okay. And the grandmother kind of takes this in stride. She doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah, she totally does. Yeah. But, um, but, but eventually by the end of it, they do establish a very, a very nice relationship that, uh, that's very heartwarming because, uh, I think, uh, through, in her own little way, she proves to David that, that, uh, she is part of the family and offers support in a way that maybe, his parents can't. Right, right, right. So three things I can kind of speak to about from my own experience. So the first scene when we meet grandma, she brings um, spices from Korea. So anchovies and and the uh, spicy pepper, gochujang. Oh, yeah. And that is something that's actually like really common, I think, with immigrant families, bringing something that's familiar to from home to this new place. Oh yeah, we Newfoundlanders do that too. Like, uh, you know, if a, if a Newfoundlander comes to to Ontario, they'll bring like um, not fish, obviously, because that's kind of hard to transport. But uh, but you know, like spices and things that are specific to the culture. Like it, it goes so much further than just like providing tools or money or you know connections. Um, it's it's kind of like the stuff that connects us to the specific place is the the sight and the smell and the taste of things right and that's why like i think you and i both really like food because it tells a lot about a certain area or a certain sure. culture um the second part is so grandma makes this like weird korean brew that's supposed to help david grow into a strong man yeah so those things are the most disgusting things you'll ever eat the one thing that is super unrealistic is that no kid at David's age would drink it without making a face or a sound or even throwing up. Because every Asian kid has probably been through that phase. Uh, probably not the same Korean and the Chinese medicine. But I imagine it probably tastes very similar. It's just boiled roots and, and all sorts of weird stuff in it. She says that she puts like deer antlers in yeah, it. Yeah. And, and so they do all sorts of like weird herbal things and grind things that are supposed to be more symbolic than have any actual, you know, medicinal uh, value to them. And it's the most disgusting thing ever. <laughs> I, I, I've i had it before I was a kid and it, you're literally drinking dirt. And I'm, I thought that was the one scene that was really unrealistic is how David managed to drink that whole bowl 
without throwing up. But you do see the soul leave his body when his mother tells him that uh, he's got to drink one of those every single day. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's it's gross. It's awful. You can almost see like the 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 barrier between the actor and the character kind of falling apart because it's, it's almost <laughs> yeah. like the the kid actor is like, wait, what is this real life? Like, <laughs> yeah. I can guarantee you probably that the kid who plays David, uh, Alan Kim, I think his name, has probably never had the real stuff before because. If you ever get a chance, Rob, I just I suggest you just take a sip so you know what it's like. Okay. Um, the third one is the Mountain Dew stuff. That oh, is yeah. hilarious. <laughs> so I'm not talking about like the practical joke he plays on, on her, which I find really funny. His dad sort of tells him that Mountain Dew is good for you because it's made from water from the mountains when it's like the most sugary pop you could ever have. <laughs> right. Um, the, a lot of like concepts that people just have when it comes to something new. Do you remember in my big fat Greek wedding, the Greek dad is obsessed with cleaning everything and disinfecting everything with Windex? Oh yeah, oh yeah. (laughs) It's kind of like that, how like they see something and they really, really love it and it somehow becomes like the elixir and the 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 one thing that solves everything. Yeah. So I thought that was really funny. I thought that was very, a small little detail that usually more geared towards people who come from another culture and, and, and find something new that they like in a new culture. But there's so many images in the in this thing that really stuck with me. I, I mean, a lot of them were kind of biblical. Like they, there's this cursed dresser <laughs> oh, right, that right. keeps like, yeah. it, it, it hurt, it, like it fall, a drawer falls on David at one point and then uh, later on the, the grandmother tries to burn it, which kind of sets off a whole series of events. Um, then they go down. Is that what she was trying to burn? I think so. Yeah. I think she, she had sort of in her mind, she had sort of, uh, fixated on the fact, uh, uh, at one point she's kind of incapacitated and she's motioning towards the dresser and she's saying to Anne, like, this thing is right. bad. And, uh, that was after the drawer had fallen on, on David's foot. So uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what she was trying to burn there, which kind of kicks off the kind of climax of the movie. A climax that happens like 20 minutes before the end, eh? And then there's like there's there's other images too. There are kind of like biblical. Obviously, there's Paul like lugging the crucifix yes. around. That's that's a big one. Um, they go down to this creek where the the titular plant Minari is growing, uh, planted by the grandmother, and there's this serpent cra- crawling right, around, right, right. and it's it's kind of like a Garden of Eden type thing with like a Satan type reference and I, I don't know how much of that is like the Isaac Chung trying to fill the thing with biblical stuff obviously there's religion plays a certain part of what's going on there Christianity is pretty big in Korea though oh yeah yeah, yeah. so, so I, maybe I, that's I, part I, of his upbringing too yeah so maybe, maybe he's just trying to work those influences in because obviously it's they, they've moved to a very um a Christian part of the United States, but evangelical Christianity and stuff like that. And of course they're coming from a place that has a tradition of that. So it's maybe the, maybe he's trying to like reflect that by blending all these images and kind of being very specific about these call outs. Right. So I really enjoyed this film. This obviously made my top 10 and I had to kind of go back and rejig my ranking. Oh yeah. But one of the things that I kind of felt held Minari back was that partway through the middle, maybe three quarters way through where it kind of loses focus I think there's a part of the film where Lee Isaac Chung doesn't know really how to end it or when to end it because it kind of ends abruptly. Like the message is clear um, about what happens to the Yi family, but it all, it takes like an hour and a half to get to that point when I feel like it could have been moved up a lot sooner. And I think there's two movies and there's, there's one where they try to make this farm work. And then there's two with them trying to integrate with the community that they're in. So the relationships they have with Paul, the the kids and their friends. I think there are certain avenues that could have been explored a little more deeply rather than, I guess, watching them argue all the time, I guess. Oh. Although that's a pretty key, key part of the relationship, yeah. So would you have, uh, would you have weighted the movie differently where there's some, um, there's less of one and more of another component? Maybe. Because the farm story ties more into their like their own personal family dynamic. And then the story about Paul and the friends is more how they interact with people outside their own circle. Keep in mind that we don't even meet any other Korean 
family, except when he goes to Oklahoma City to sell his groceries to a Korean grocer. Yeah, they do meet like another Korean in the chicken factory. Oh, in the yeah, but right. She, but she's kind of there to sort of say like, oh, well, there are Koreans around, but they kind of keep to themselves, and they haven't. Uh, like Monica asks if there's a Korean church that's been established, and and this lady says. No, I mean, there's only like 15 Koreans in there. They, they left the cities in Korea to get away from the church. So she sort of implies that like that, that they're not kind of interested in, in religion. And that seems to kind of ward Monica away. She doesn't really feel like she belongs with those people. Their co-worker in the factory. Actually, we never see her outside the factory either. Yeah. So we don't really know what she's like, other than the fact that she's obviously quite settled there. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I kind of took points off that because Minari it does kind of end abruptly in my opinion I thought the the climax with the whole burning thing took place a little too late for my liking I would have moved that a little bit more I would have gone into the Minari stuff a bit more because it's kind of mentioned in passing twice first at uh, at the end of course and then at the first where they're talking where the grandma's talking about planting it yeah and it's supposed to be this like really resilient plant that you can grow anywhere and it's supposed to be sort of like, I guess, symbolic of their own roots being put in Arkansas. Yes. So I wish there was a bit more about the dresser and the snake and sort of elaborated more on those things. They make some references to it, but um, but like you said, it, it can be a, it's a little bit ambiguous in the end what exactly the grandmother is burning and if if she's burning it because she feels it's cursed or, or for some other reason. So, uh, yeah, I can see how the, that's a bit vague. So I, I thought Steven Yoon was good. The woman who plays Monica, her name is Han Ye Ri. I thought they were both really good. I thought the grandma was a... Like, considering how much buzz she got, I thought she was a little overrated. Okay. <laughs> Will Patton was a little hard to decipher because there's certain times where he's a caricature. Yeah. And I'm always kind of wary of people who turn ugly in movies. Right. Because you, you there's almost like a part of you that sympathizes with the character. You're like, Will Patton's not that ugly, <laughs> but he's playing an ugly character, physically ugly character. So I guess right. bonus points to that because he's got a heart of gold kind of feel to it. But yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, it ranks in my top 10. It's borderline top five for sure. Um, after seeing this, are, would you have added this to your top 10? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I went the full five out of five on Letterboxd when I logged it. Oh, okay. Interesting. I mean, I, all of your criticisms are totally valid, but the uh, just for me, like... I was I got kind of swept up in it. I I I couldn't really identify anything that I, that I would have personally changed. It's so well shot. I can't get over that. It looks so good. Because I, I think uh, Lee Isaac Chung he shot it on he shot it on digital with like vintage Panavision. I think was the um uh, the type of lens that he used. Uh, so it's got a bit of like a an eighties kind of mm -hmm. grit to it, even though it's it's shot digitally. And I can definitely see how some of those those biblical references might be a little bit on the nose for people, or might feel a bit cringy depending on where you're coming from so i can see that but i mean for me it's it's definitely one of the best of the year so yeah it, it's got to be in my top five for sure i just have to decide what it's gonna bump out now <laughs> <laughs> that was the hard part did you have was there like a scene or a sequence in particular that really like if you were cutting the reel for the awards um preview that you would use I mean, I think I'd have to put Will Patton in there just just because 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 <laughs> I did I did like his character a lot. Um, I like the parts where him and Jacob are working the field and they don't say much to each other because there's language barrier. Yeah. But they just kind of like high five or they thumbs up or they just say, good job. Good job. Right. I, I kind of like those parts because um, you can read a lot from their faces. If you had to pick like one or two scenes that had to fit into the reel, I think you'd either have to go with like Jacob and David finding water on the property or mm, right. um, something with David and Grandma. I think you would have right. to have to do that. Um, maybe something like when David's having trouble falling asleep and Grandmother finally kind of comforts him for the first time. Right. Maybe something like that. Uh, so yeah, high recommendation for me. Uh, it's available pretty much everywhere. Like it's it's one of those um, twenty five dollar rentals, to, or mm -hmm. depending on where well where you're renting it from. Um, but it's available on all the platforms. So so go check it out if you. Uh, uh, it, it'll definitely get some love at the the nominations next month uh, for the Oscars. I think the nominations are out March 15th. Mm -hmm. So if it's not in the best picture and best director category, I think uh, film Twitter is going to riot. <laughs> well, realistically, what do you think it would be in? Best actor, best actress, or the acting categories in general. Best picture, best 
original screenplay? Uh, yeah, best original screenplay. Um, cinematography. Not sure about editing because um, the editing is kind of naturalistic. There's nothing too flashy about it. As we know, like in the, the editing category ten, tends to go to... Uh, the, the next film we'll talk about yeah, editing. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I think editing is a, a bigger important or a bigger part of that film. But um, yeah, production design, like it definitely looks like it happened in the past, but I didn't think there was anything particular to make you think that it was specifically set in the 80s. I mean, other than maybe the car. It doesn't do that 80s nostalgia thing where it's just like, we're in the 80s and it plays a bunch of like 80s music needle drops or whatever. Right, right. So right. you just uh, segued or you, uh, made an allusion to our next film, uh, which uh, might also have, have uh, quite some presence at the Oscars mm-hmm. in a couple weeks time. Uh, and that is uh, Judas and the Black Messiah, directed by uh, Shaka King. The Black Panthers are forming a rainbow coalition of oppressed brothers and sisters of every color. Their aim is to sow hatred and inspire terror. I will learn all that I can. I will learn. These ain't no terrorists. You can murder a liberator, but you can't murder liberation. You can murder a revolutionary, but you can't murder revolution. This is another one that I think you put it on your most anticipated of mm-hmm. 2020. Uh, cause I guess you'd heard about it. 2020. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> what a joke that was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's linked on the, the front page of the website for people who are curious. And we've tried to go in and kind of adjust the release dates and link to our reviews and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but this is another kind of like thing that came out of the festival circuit. It's a lot of buzz around it before it actually came out. It finally premiered at, uh, this year's Sundance. So I guess it had been pushed back and immediately Huge praise from all of the critics. Daniel Kaluuya is in the main role. He's getting a lot of attention for best actor, potentially. But the story revolves around Fred Hampton, one of the founders of the Black Panther Party in uh, Chicago. And the campaign waged against him by the, the FBI, the surveillance campaign, and how they recruit this mole, a young guy played by uh, Lakeith Stanfield, who is a car thief who pretends to be an FBI agent to kind of perpetuate his con, but the cops catch him and then they use the criminal charges against him as leverage to convince him, all right, you're going to be our mole in the Black Panther Party. You're going to observe Fred Fred Hampton. You're going to inform on on his activities to us. And uh, the FBI's investigation is led by an agent played by Jesse Plemons. Very, very solid casting there. I love Jesse Plemons. <laughs> Something about Jesse Plemons, this kind of like, you know, barely restrained kind of rage. To say that he has an upsetting presence would do him disservice because he's a really good actor. Yeah. But he often plays characters in which where they have this really good poker face and you never quite know where their loyalties lie. Yes. So he, he and it could come off like creepy as in this one and dangerous. And it could come off as really creepy and funny, as in um, Game Night. Game Night, yeah, for sure. So the But the relationship, it's kind of like a three-way relationship between Fred Hampton, uh, Lakeith Stanfield's character. What, what's what's his character's name again? It's a real-life guy. Bill O'Neill. William O'Neill. William O'Neill, yeah. Um, and then the FBI agent played by Jesse Plemons. And they're kind of it's ca- uh, sort of a three-way cat and mouse type of situation. And right. um, as Bill O'Neill rises up and becomes uh, more well-respected in the Black Panther Party, um, his position gets increasingly compromised and he uh, he's kind of plagued with all of this self-doubt, whether or not he's going to get caught, what will happen to him, will he be tortured and killed? Um, is it is that worse than being thrown in prison for his entire life by the FBI? Um, is he betraying his brothers and sisters in the in the um, uh, the black community by doing all of this? You know, well, first of all, I did not realize that this was a true story. I had no idea Fred Hampton was brought down by an FBI informant. The only, well, the first time I'd heard about this, and this is probably terrible because I, I did so much like history in university. Hey, me but too. But. I first, <laughs> I, I first heard about the Fred Hampton's uh, murder in Trial of the Chicago Seven because it's a minor, oh, okay. minor plot point where they come to Bobby Seale, who's who was tried alongside the Chicago Seven in yes. 1968, 69, um, and they tell him that Fred Hampton is dead and that uh, he's. They kind of expect him to freak out, but he actually he'd already heard about it from somewhere. So, the, the, mm-hmm. the yeah. Uh, so that's a minor scene in there, which kind of makes Trial of the Chicago 7 and this movie sort of a perfect double feature in a way. Very different approaches, though, I think. So uh, we talked about editing. Can you believe this is Shaka King's second feature length film? I thought the way he balanced all the storylines and the editing was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And just like 
uh, the tension was unreal throughout the whole thing. Like, uh, so just to start off, like this happened, this movie sort of happens over like a small period of time. Uh, Fred Hampton actually rises up the Black Panther ranks quite quickly, mm-hmm. and we actually go through the entire period where Fred Hampton is in is uh, a free person put in jail and then a free person again. Mm-hmm. But the movie starts off with like a fake interview of Bill O'Neill. Yeah, it's a recreation of a real life interview, but uh, they've they recreate it with Lakeith Stanfield. That's right. The film starts with that, and then they kind of go back and tell the story. But then they keep kind of jumping back and forth because they start talking about how Bill O'Neill gets recruited by the FBI even before he meets Hampton. And then it progresses through his relationship with Hampton. And then it goes back for a little bit to talk about more of Fred Hampton's previous life and and Bill O'Neill's previous life. And so I just thought like the way it was set up, the way it was edited, even with the flashbacks and and the time jumps, it all made sense. It was easy to make heads and tails of what happened when and how it happened. And I think that takes a lot of skill. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're talking about Bill O'Neill, who at the time I think was supposed to be 17 when he meets Fred Hampton, which I thought was kind of incredible because I think he mentions his age in the movie, too. But Lakeith Stanfield is obviously not a teenager. Like he yeah. looks like he looks much older than that. Same thing with Daniel Kaluuya, who we're shocked to discover at the end is playing a guy who's 21 when he was killed. When he died. Exactly. And and Daniel Kaluuya is great. And he's really made a niche for himself playing like these really edgy revolutionary characters who really blur the line of uh, of moral ambiguity. Yeah. I think it was more interesting to read some of the the end titles where they explain what happens afterwards. I thought a lo- some of that could have been put in the film rather than just having text. Yeah. Because I thought that some of the stuff in there was pretty damning, especially the part where we find out that Bill O'Neill, following the airing of his one and only interview regarding Fred Hampton's death, actually ended up killing himself. Yeah, the night that interview aired, yeah. Exactly. And, you know, there, it, it, it finishes off the movie with archival footage of Fred Hampton and the real Bill O'Neill. Yeah. And you really get the sense of that this was a guy who was cornered into a an impossible situation and made the best of it. And he, rightly or wrongly, chose a better life, which includes money, steak dinners, <laughs> property... <laughs> Over, I guess, a revolution, a, a a calling made by his own people, I guess. And I thought that was an interesting dynamic. And I thought Lakeith Sanfield's performance is incredible because every time they they showed his face, it was almost as if he was in agony. Yes, and he was he was having a lot of trouble balancing the two sides, much like The Departed with Leonardo DiCaprio. Very similar kind of dynamics and. Um the, it, it asks a lot of Lakeith Stanfield, especially as his character gets exposed to the really radical parts of the Black Panther Party, like the, the folks who are right. uh, who are torturing people and who obviously they they're less interested in kind of a peaceful resolution of the of the of the issues. Right. And they they just want to hurt as many white people as possible. So there are those elements within the Black Panther Party that just terrify Bill O'Neill. And he's he's convinced that he's going to end up like you know, chopped up at the bottom of a river somewhere. Right, right. And going back to Jesse Plemons, I thought he played the character very well. Roy Mitchell comes off as this character who's going to eventually backstab Bill O'Neill. Like, that's just kind of like the vibe you get. Yeah. But he never quite does that. I mean, he keeps his end of the bargain. And there are scenes where he meets with uh, Hoover, played by Martin Sheen, in like one of his worst performances ever. I, think. I was going to ask you about that. I was like, there's been a, a he was an hi- awful Hoover. There's a long history of Hoovers on screen. And, uh, and none of them Sheen's, are good. Yeah. Martin Sheen's version is not on the top of the tier there. Yeah. He's got some weird makeup going on, too. eh? Like he looks nothing like Hoover. At, at first, I thought he would it would just be a basically like a glancing cameo because you'd only see Hoover in a that kind of scene on the stage near the beginning. Right, but then right, they have right. a, a rather extended scene between him and Jesse Plemons. And right. that's where the the illusion starts to break down a little bit. Right, right. And I'm glad that they never broke down Roy Mitchell into this basic prejudiced, egotistical FBI agent that a lot of movies make them out to be. I think there is a sympathetic side to Roy Mitchell. Yeah. I kind of wish we got to know more about him, but the movie wasn't 
about him anyway, so I understood that. You know what that reminds me of actually is a um uh there was a movie with Kristen Stewart playing Gene Seberg. Oh, Seberg, yeah, that movie, yeah. And uh, I saw that at not this past TIFF, but the TIFF before. And the movie is, on the whole, very bad, unfortunately. <laughs> but there, but one of the ma- one of the things that it does uh, the worst is how it puts excessive focus on the FBI agent who's tailing Seberg and mm. almost makes half the movie about him and his own kind of struggles over whether to surveil Gene Seberg. And mm-hmm. Gene Seberg's story is actually was happening parallel to the Fred Hampton Black Panther stuff. Right. Yes. Um, you know, same same period, same kind of like the FBI was freaking out about the Black Panther Party and was just surveilling anyone who had even any connection to it. Uh, But the problem with that movie was it just like we got way too far into the FBI agent's life. And what you really want to know about it are the the kind of victims of their surveillance. Um, The other thing is that although the movie focuses a lot on um, Fred Hampton and Bill O'Neill, obviously, there are a lot of quite a few background characters that I wish they had spent more time on. Yeah. Especially with some of the younger Black Panther members. Uh, They touched on the Rainbow Coalition, which was Fred Hampton's basically effort to unite all the rival gangs in Chicago. Right. I thought that was a really key moment in, in, I guess, playing up this character and how important Fred Hampton was to that specific era. I thought that was kind of a missed opportunity. But, I mean, again, credit to Shaka King for even managing to pull it off. And it actually looks incredible, too. Like, we talked about Minari with the incredible cinematography. Yeah. This one has really good cinematography, too. Oh, it does, yeah. And the, uh, there was also a lot of uh, discussion online about the score and the um, the soundtrack. And I'm, a, I'm in agreement on that, although there's one music moment when Fred Hampton goes to try to recruit the Rainbow Coalition for the first time. And he had, has this really tense meeting in this, what looks like a like a church hall or something like that. Right, right. right and right. there was... With the with the crowns. With the right? crowns, yeah. And and the scene is very tense, but there's there, there was this kind of upbeat bass line <laughs> uh, kind of thrumming away in the background. Yeah. And it struck me as a bit of an odd choice because it was so it was so kind of like uh, happy sounding or kind of like jokey. Well, but the, but the scene itself was very tense and you weren't sure if like these guys were just going to draw guns on each other. Um, so the music being, you know, such a big hit was something I found out after the film while watching it. It didn't really, you know, I guess tingle my senses as much as I thought it would. Yeah, I I, I can't recall like a particular theme or sound that. I really associate with this movie. It's more it's more the aesthetic, the look, and obviously Kaluuya's speech as Fred Hampton when he's basically lecturing all these new recruits. I thought those were the most incredible scenes. And you get the shot from bottom up, like the classic authority figure shot, but he's also off to the side. So it's kind of like his radical beliefs versus, you know, people just taking this in. I thought that was really, really uh, interesting sort of visual choice. Can you believe that Shaka King's first feature length film was called Newlyweeds about a stoner married couple? <laughs> I read this online. I was like, first of all, I want to watch that movie. Second of all, how do you go from Newlyweeds stoner couple comedy to something like this where it's so like yeah. historical and heavy and, and, and has all sorts of uh, themes and, and uh, ideas about where we are today and, and race relations. Yeah, I mean, I'd have to go back and read a little bit more about the timeline for the production on this, because obviously right now it feels like a very timely movie to come out uh, on the heels of the, um, the the resurgence in the Black Lives Matter movement over the summer and um, and all of right. that. Uh, but obviously, like... It, this the production on this would have had would have started before that so clearly it was something that Chaka King and his production team they you know they had been tracking for a while they wanted to you know um, uh, pull this thing together and I can't say that I, I think I enjoyed Minari more at the end of the day oh interesting yeah, okay because um, I, I I'm the opposite oh interesting okay I, I enjoyed both like you know, full disclosure, I enjoyed both. But I just, while I was redoing my top 10, I had Judas and Black Messiah just edging Minari. Okay. Because I think Judas and Black Messiah felt, the story arc felt a little more complete. I thought the pacing was a little better. And, that, and I think that's what gave him the edge. Yeah, because for me, like, uh, I did really enjoy Judas and the Black Messiah. I Although I felt at the end that um, there was a few too many kind of typical biopic like historical biopic kind of moments in it. Well, and like we said, it was rushed, right? Because there's so much information just packed on at the end. And that's why I kind of, I thought about it in terms of being a perfect double feature to Trial of the Chicago 7, because you get this like 
Trial of the Chicago 7 does a lot to download the to you, especially to somebody who isn't super familiar with the history, um, a lot of the issues that were being discussed at the time and kind of lays out. It's kind of like the introductory bit. But then the Judas and the Black Messiah is like your seminar, like your mm -hmm. your really focused um, lesson on a on a more particular uh, piece and certain characters within that broader thing. It's less of an ensemble piece. Right. So we both agree that uh, Judas and the Black Messiah is incredible. So does it crack your top five then? Because it did for me, actually. I don't know. I think it it might be hovering in like 11 for me. 11, eh? Okay. Cause, yeah, because I'm like, I, I'm at four out of five on it. So I, I liked Minari just one full star more. Isn't that a pretty big gap, though? Like one star? Yeah, yeah, I, I guess. I, I mean... <laughs> uh, but but you know how like star rankings go where like yes, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. a certain amount of it is is just your own kind of um, subjective reaction to it and not so much the, the functional kind of filmmaking ups and downs. OK, so let me put it this way then. So other than, you know, the sort of the biopic ending, was there another part where that you felt really could have improved on that would have maybe pushed it to four and a half or even five? It does get slow at certain points, but not often enough because there's a subplot about another mole that the FBI has planted in the Black Panthers that they didn't really go any further with. And I felt like that was a very counterpoint to um, Bill O'Neill's role as an informant because it would have just been interesting to see how these two characters' motivations are different, even though they're doing the same job, basically. And I'm trying to decide, like, what I wanted to see more scenes depicting the stuff that the Black Panther Party was doing in the community. We get a few flashes of that. Like, we see them doing a school lunch program, for example, and that's where, they, right, where right. Fred Hampton gets arrested, actually. Uh, the other voice in my head is saying, like, maybe we don't need to see that stuff because that's kind of the introductory material that Trial of the Chicago 7 got bogged down in. It's better if the film is more focused and tighter and doesn't... It assumes the... The audience is smart enough to look up those details afterwards. I don't know. I think this was way better than Trial of the Chicago 7. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for and, sure. And I think Trial of Chicago 7 is a very made for the masses type of movie. Yes. Even though they tackle very similar subject material. That one just Aaron Sorkin has a way of just making dialogue sound clever and smart and, and whip fast. This one has more quieter moments. And I think it allows you to for things to just sink in. I love that scene where Bill O'Neill visits Roy Mitchell's house for the first time. Right. He, all the entire time. They're not really talking about work because Bill O'Neill is fascinated by like Mitchell's lifestyle. It's like he's an FBI agent, but he has a liquor cabinet. He's got a nice house. He's yep. got a nice living. And so the most poignant line he delivered, I think, in that movie was, how much money do you make? Right. And Roy's just like, well, you know, and he, he's probably being honest, too. He probably doesn't make that much. But he just goes, you know what? It's a living. But I think at the end of the day, that's what Bill O'Neill wanted, right? He went from boosting cars, posing as, a, a, as an agent, to wanting something like that. And I think that's part of the reason why he became an informant. Yes. And also, at the end of the day, why he killed himself, because he felt guilty. Oh, yeah. He felt like he sold out his own culture, his own race, or his own ideas of what they should be in America. I, I thought that was one element that I think could have used more play because I thought that was really interesting. What a year for black filmmakers, though, eh? And yeah. films about black people. Well, I think a lot of production companies and distributors, they, they know that they have to do better on this because, um, you know, the, the hashtag Oscar so white uh, comes back every year. I read something online. And I'm not sure how accurate it was, but it was I remember it was a like reputable news source about how the demographic that ended up watching Judas and the Black Messiah was only 20% Caucasian. Oh, okay. Yeah, so this is one of those movies, and same with Minari too, where the demographic just won't be very big just because of the subject material itself. It's it's not something that I think most casual moviegoers would find particularly interesting. And if you have you know no real horse or even no real interest in, in these kinds of issues, it's just going to feel really boring for you. Yeah, it is something that you have to seek out. Like, you know, if you if if you say to somebody at the office, for example, like, oh, what movie did you watch this weekend? And you say Judas and the Black Messiah. And they'll be like, what, what is that? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And it, then you have to explain it and you have to give them a primer on the history. Or even Minari is like that. You know, people will yeah, say, what's, what's a Minari, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I just think maybe it's because we've held up 
off all the like action blockbusters. But this year's slate was all very serious. Yeah. Stuff that tackles really hardcore issues in society about race and homelessness, like in Nomad Land. Yeah. Even Soul from Pixar was about a black man who um, had to decide what, how he wanted to live his life and what kinds of things he, he should pursue. Like I said, still a couple of weeks to go until the official nominations are out. It'll be a while before we can kind of comment on those. And we'll see what how many of these uh, intimate, uh, small indie movies actually make the cut. I think most of them would have to because I I mean, you really like Tenet. But I'm also just trying to think of any other blockbuster that made the impact that Tenet did. I don't think there were any. Not a blockbuster, but I mean, you'll have movies that are kind of on the scale of Trial of the Chicago 7 that will probably eat up some uh some space you know that that's kind of my dark horse because it's such an accessible movie for like the middle age people it was kind of like that michael b jordan movie where he plays a, a harvard lawyer or something with brie larson oh yeah what was that called it, it, was, it was it had a really stupid lame like 90s legal drama title yeah it was like uh it had oscar bait written all over it from the second the trailer came out <laughs> yeah yeah. So Judas and the Black Messiah, I think so Kaluya is obviously gonna get some sort of nomination. He's just been cleaning yeah. up everywhere. Um Lakeith Stanfield, do you think he has a chance? I really liked his performance. I don't know why he's not getting more buzz. I don't think he got overshadowed or anything. No, I don't think he got overshadowed. I think it, it, he's got the harder role in the sense that he's supposed to be playing oh, sure. a, a very inwardly focused character who's trying not to be noticed. And mm-hmm. Kaluuya is playing the guy on the stage who's uh, delivering the speeches. And uh, as we know, Oscars tend to go to the people who've got the big speeches. Well, yeah. And I mean, Fred Hampton is a very like he has a very distinct and iconic way of speaking. Right. And so yeah. um, in, in some ways, I think Kaluuya has more to work with rather than you know, Bill O'Neill, who's only been, you know, seen once in archival footage. The actor that I'm still rooting for in that race has got to be Riz Ahmed still, just because I, I love Sound of Metal. But yes. um, uh, but I have I have legitimately no idea where it's going to go. We really have to wait until the SAG Awards get uh, passed out before we have any indication what <laughs> what's going on. What they're on. thinking, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, the Golden Globes are happening right now as we're recording <laughs> stop giving them oxygen they don't need any more oxygen we hate the golden True. gloves on this show or at least i do no no i'm with you I, I think they're just a joke i think it's just a good show because celebrities get hammered well they, they did i don't even know what this year's show is going to be like oh that's true oh, even easier to get hammered at home because no one's watching you yeah right <laughs> you have a bottle on the side that's off camera and no one will ever see we will be checking back in on the Oscar race probably in a couple episodes time once those nominations are out. So we'll have some reaction to that. We're also planning an episode where uh, another one of our bonus episodes where we go back to a movie from the 90s that mm. I haven't seen that Jason has seen and we and I watch it and we get a chance to talk about it. So the one that we selected for the next bonus episode is Gattaca with Ethan Hawke. 1997. So you can look forward to that in the near future. And if you're looking for more stuff to read, you can head over to kinetoscope.ca where I have a review of a movie I saw recently. We didn't talk about it here on the show. Uh, It's called I Care A Lot with Rosamund Pike. And if you're liking what you're listening to here on the show, make sure that you give us a rating, follow the show on the podcast app of your choice. We're not asking, we're demanding. Yes, we're (laughs) Yes, we're demanding. (laughs) Make us famous. But that about does it for this episode. My name is Robert Snow in Toronto. And my name is Jason Chen in Vancouver. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.